Hi, I'm Brendan Clark. Welcome back to Philosophy of Medicine. Uh, this is lecture six, uh, which is about definitions of disease. So the plan for today is to try and think about how we might define disease. And this is going to be based on uh, some fairly contemporary literature from Philosophy of Medicine. Um, and we're then going to use that to try and make sense of the, the case study that we talked about in, in the last lecture, in Lecture 5, which was uh, the question uh, about how you might define uh, chronic fatigue, and, and particularly whether or not that's a disease. So we're going to begin with a very, very short bit of philosophical work, which is about the difference between facts and values. Um, and now this is obviously related to the kind of distinction between is statements and ought statements that we talked about in a previous lecture. But just very briefly, let me give you an example. Um, and it's going to use this. Mm. 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 Very nice. Mug of coffee. Let's make a factual statement. I just drank from my mug of coffee. Uh, it's a factual statement because, well basically because it describes things that, that have happened in the world and because we think that we've got pretty straightforward truth conditions for it, right? We can investigate the world in some way and decide whether that factual statement is true or false. I mean, it is a mug of coffee. I did just drink from it and so on. But now let's think about a value statement. Um, or maybe we can think about a kind of related ought statement, and we could say something like, I ought not to have drunk from that coffee. Um, and there our kind of relationship with truth is a bit more complicated, largely because it depends on our values. So, for example, I might highly value speaking in a concise way without interruptions uh, when giving lectures, right? <laughs> Although, given my usual performance, I think that's pretty unlikely. <laughs> Um, but the, the point is there that I might use that value statement to support the ought statement. I ought not to have drunk from that coffee uh, because it brings me into a disvalued state where I interrupt myself and go, hmm, hmm, coffee, and I lose the point of the lecture. That's, uh, for the discussion that we're going to have about diseases, pretty important, the difference between these factual statements, um, bet well, between facts that ground descriptive statements about what is um, versus values which can be used to ground effectively moral judgments about what what we ought or ought not to do. Okay, so um, it's also worth, as I suppose, noting a, a bit of a, in a bit of a nod back to Arthur Kaplan that this uh, this kind of is or is uh, is very related to the kind of difference between analytic philosophy of medicine and between bioethics. And we, if we're following Kaplan, would typically say that philosophy of medicine is descriptive, whereas bioethics is normative. Um, and actually, I think this kind of topic is a pretty good venue to quibble with that kind of distinction between species of philosophical work from Kaplan. But anyway, that for now is a digression. Let's move on to think about definitions of disease. Um, and our first kind of starting point is to know that there are lots of diseases. That's very obvious. What you might not know, though, is that there are various ways of um, speaking about what counts as a disease in an authoritative way. If you go to cms.gov, or here, the, the version from the World, World Health Organization, you can look up the ICD-10. This is the uh, International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. Now, this is something that's curated by, I think, a fairly small team, actually, at the World Health Organization. And it's meant to be a, a pretty well exhaustive classification, taxonomy, if you like, of diseases. And it's worth, if you've never kind of played with this before or heard about it, it's worth going and having a look and seeing what, what's what. Um, so, for example, you can go to chapter 11, which deals with d d diseases of the digestive system. Um, and then you can go to part K70 to 77, and you can look at diseases of the liver. And you can see there's a taxonomy of uh, say uh, alcoholic liver disease that's all the case 70 point something codes 
uh, or toxic liver disease in the K71 codes, or K72 uh, liver failure, or hepatic failure not otherwise classified, um, and so on and so on and so on. It's a very detailed and fine, grain, uh, fine grained classification of diseases. <clears throat> That's not to say that all the things that doctors think about count as diseases. Um, and there's a, there's a very interesting and provocative survey that's now 15 years old nearly, uh, that was published in the, in the British Medical Journal in 2002, which was a survey about non-diseases. Um, and this was a survey of doctors, or at least readers of the BMJ, uh, to identify non Diseases. This survey generates a quite interesting list of non-diseases. Things like ageing and work and boredom and bags under the eyes and ignorance and baldness and, and lots of things that I think intuitively most of us wouldn't think of as, um, <clears throat> as diseases. However, further down this list there were some really interesting examples of things where opinion uh, in the, the kind of professional group that reads the BMJ was really kind of split. Um, so, for example, high blood pressure was roughly 50-50 split and acne and gallstones. Uh, other things that I think, um, I think are diseases, right? And um, the point of this, though, is that it is at least an open question as to whether Lots of things that might be encountered in medical to practice should count as diseases. Now, something that we'll explore in the tutorials is what the kind of implications of this are. What is the specialness that people are trying to pick out when they say that certain things are or are not diseases? With that kind of introduction to the difference between facts and values in hand, I also want to kind of give a second aim of all of this. Now, I think the aim of medical practice in its broadest possible sense is is health, is to help as many people be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Um, and I think the World Health Organization, I mean, the, the, the clues in the, in the name, I suppose, um, have similar ideas in mind. And they actually have a, an interesting definition of health. Um, and they say this, they say health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, now that's kind of quite interesting and actually I think that's a very very strong definition. Um, I'm not sure I know too many people who leave, who spend much time in a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. Um, but I, I, I suppose I can see the force of the aspiration. Um, note that it tells us too that, that health and disease are related in some way, right? Um, but it's not a straightforward kind of way, so just having no diseases isn't sufficient as far as the WHO are concerned to, to give you health. Um, you need some other stuff too. You need, well, I, I suppose social well-being might be the kind of lion's share of that, right? Um, the question remains though, what is this disease thing? What, how do we kind of define it? What, what does it mean? Um, and that's where the philosophy literature would hopefully help us. Um, and for this, I'm going to use a paper by Oshevsky, 2009, um, where he gives three very different ways of defining diseases. And that's what I think I'd like to run through over the next few minutes. So he splits definitions of disease up into kind of three species, if you like. These are the naturalist, the normativist, and hybrid theories. Okay, well, with that in mind, let's look at a paradigmatic example of, natural, of a naturalist theory. And this is uh, the one uh, by Christopher Bourse. Um, it's been around for a long time. He's published lots of different variations on it. And we'll talk about this a bit more in the tutorial. Um, but the, the essential idea is a pretty simple one. Uh, what you do is, in order to define a disease, you look at the statistical distribution of some property um, in a population. So for example, you might look at blood pressure and you might go out and measure the blood pressures of a big group of people. Um, and you then essentially say that the kind of outlying parts of the resulting distribution of blood pressures that you get 
represent disease states. Um, so very roughly, the uh, far tail of people with very high blood pressure count as having disease, hyper, hypertension, uh, and I suppose that the, on the other end of the distribution, the people with very low blood pressure have hypotension. Um, he gives a bit more detail actually in his 1997, and it's, it's worth us just kind of running through that to, to get to grips with some of the complexities. So um, this, uh, this kind of gloss has, has four parts. The first is that you, you, you talk about a reference class that is a group of individuals um, that are uh, similar in some important respect or respect. So you might take an age group or, or uh, a gender group or something. We're going to talk about reference classes in much more detail later on in the course. So I will just park that here. The idea is that a reference class is a group that are homogeneous. That is, they are the same with respect to some important characteristic or other. So you take some reference class of people um, and then you um, look at them with respect to some particular function, to normal function, um, and you characterize that statistically. Third, you then make a decision that part of the distribution of that function in that reference class um, counts as a diseased state. Um, so, um, <clears throat> For example, um, your function might be below some threshold value that counts as, uh, you know, um, sufficient to impair something functionally. So, for example, that's the idea about taking the outlying values in a statistical distribution. He finally then claims that health is the absence of disease. Um, this is at odds with the World Health Organization definition and something that we'll, we'll talk about in the tutorial a bit. But anyway, that's an, a, an example of a, uh, of a naturalist theory. Um, there are others too, and we'll talk a bit more about these later on. Um, but essentially, there, there are basically different ways of characterizing what is normal for, for an individual. Um, so that's one class of definitions of disease. The, a second major one are normativist theories. So roughly, normativists believe that our use of the terms health and disease reflect value judgments. So healthy states are those that we desire, that we think are good, that we value. Um, whereas disease states are states that we want to avoid. There's a, a useful quote here from Engelhardt. Um, who, who summarises very neatly, actually, that disease does not reflect a natural standard or norm because nature does nothing. Nature does not care for excellence, nor is it concerned with the fate of individuals. Health must involve judgments as to what members of that species should be able to do. That is, must involve our esteeming a particular kind of function. Um, that's a very brief kind of introduction, but the idea here is, I hope, clear. Um, roughly, normativist theories depend on making health all about value judgments. So healthy states are those that we value, and unhealthy states are the one, and disease states are the ones that we disvalue. Um, on the other hand, the naturalist theories would tend to favour some more factual description. So the kind of statistical work characterising blood pressure, for instance. Um, and saying that the outlying ends of the distribution are those that count as disease states. Now we can find supporting evidence for, I think, both theories pretty easily. Um, so we know, for example, that when uh, things like blood tests are calibrated, now, the, that when blood tests are calibrated, they are done in this very statistical way. You essentially characterize a large, you measure some value across a large range of the population and you call the extreme ends of the distribution abnormal. Now, that's not to say that blood tests necessarily identify disease states in some direct way. They, they in fact don't at all. 
Um, but the general kind of way of thinking, I think, is pretty easy to find. And we can find similar things about values too. The most kind of infamous example, I suppose, is the one that happens um, in the revisions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a large manual of uh, psychiatric diagnoses, um, where before 1973, December 1973, one of the items, um, so 302.0, um, that was uh, as a legitimate psychiatric diagnosis was homosexuality. Um, we now, in general, <clears throat> We now, of course, don't characterise being gay as a mental disorder in any way. Um, and in fact, there's, there's some very interesting work about why exactly this change happened. But uh, the, 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 the shortcut here is that it's to do with changing social values. We don't disvalue homosexuality in the same way that we did um, when the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was first assembled. Finally, our third way of thinking about disease is via a hybrid theory of some stripe. Um, as the name might suggest, hybrid theories try and have the best of both worlds. Um, they define health and disease by combining aspects of naturalism and normativism. Um, so a nice example of this is Wakefield. Um, and Wakefield says that a condition is a disorder if and only if a, the condition causes some harm as judged by the standards of the person's culture. That's very values -y, right? Uh, and B, the condition results in the inability of some internal mechanism to perform its natural function. And that sounds very naturalist to me. Um, there are lots of examples of hybrid theories, um, and we'll talk about some of them in the tutorial a bit. What I want to point out, though, is that in general there's a worry that the hybrid theories don't really get the best of both worlds. In fact, they they sort of inherit both sets of problems, um, and we're going to discuss at some in some detail the kind of problems that different naturalist and normativist theories of disease have. I mean, the most obvious one is that they really struggle to accommodate some kinds of of diseases that we intuitively think are diseases, and we can find kind of. Uh, difficult counterexamples for both. Um, and there's a worry that hybrid theories would inherit both of those anyway. It's also worth thinking here, because we're reading Archevsky, it's worth thinking about his solution to this whole kind of, uh, his, his, his uh, solution to the weaknesses of current ways of trying to define diseases. And he essentially says that we should be explicit about what things we are invoking. When we talk, when we're trying to describe something as disease, so we should talk about, we should explicitly talk about the considerations that are central in medical discussions. Um, now, I think that that makes his position quite close to the kind of hybrid theories. I suspect that Archevsky would disagree, but again, that's something that we can discuss. That's all for now. Towards some sort of conclusion, then there are lots of different ways of thinking about diseases. Some of them are mainly based on facts. Some of them are mainly based on values, and some of them are based on combinations of the two. My kind of crazy assertion to close with, though, is that I don't think these accounts of disease that are intended to be completely generic, right, they're, they're intended to let you decide whether any given set of entities constitute a disease or not, are much help. And certainly if we think about the chronic fatigue case from the last video, it's not very clear how we could resolve any of the open questions by using these accounts of definitions of disease. I think there's something else going on in chronic fatigue syndrome that's really important. And I think that the missing something has to do with causation. Um, note that the kind of central part of the, a central part of the definition of chronic fatigue syndrome is that it's idiopathic. It has no known cause. And I think that, that kind of difficulty about causation is really important to the kind of arguments that happen in CFS um, about whether or not it's a disease. And we can certainly see lots of examples where uh, chronic fatigue of some kind that is caused by an illness, 
is treated very differently from idiopathic chronic fatigue syndrome. And that, I hope, is going to set us up a little bit for the next lecture, which is where we start thinking about ways that medicine thinks about causation. So anyway, that's all for now. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I've been Brendan Clark, and this has been Lecture 6 of Philosophy of Medicine from UCLSTS. Thanks. See you.